All right, everyone, a quick congratulations in order to the UK. January 31st is set to be their new Independence Day. Whether it'll be celebrated by some of the people over there or not, of course, remains to be seen. The UK will exit the European Union on January 31st. They voted um, a bunch of people. I think a bunch of Labour people actually voted with the Tories, like 10 of them. Uh, if I remember correctly, and so they're overwhelmingly, they voted in favor to OK Boris Johnson's proposal. Now, by and large, this is Theresa May's proposal. That is that the UK, at least for the next year, remains under EU rules. And what's going to happen, what's going to happen is that for the next year, the, e the EU gets to bully the UK around while they negotiate, which is a terrible idea, but I mean, under the circumstances, I suppose it was the best deal that they could possibly get. At least, at the very least, in name, Brexit goes forward. That's good news, number one. Negotiations are ongoing with a government now emboldened and at least competent enough to do some trade negotiations. That's good, number two. But number three, and this is the bad part, is that for almost a year, uh, Britons actually will be slaves. You will be under EU rules without having a vote uh, in the EU. That's a bad position to be in when you're trying to negotiate a trade deal. Ultimately, though, let's say that everything, all hell breaks loose. End of the year, you got no deal. Nothing has been accomplished. The EU keeps trying to abuse you, which is very possible. Can you not, now that you're a sovereign nation as of the end of the year, simply turn around and strike trade deals with other states? You know, the EU isn't the only part of the world. It's very funny to watch. The UK, or at least, or at least most of the leftists within the UK, and some of the right, some of the anti-Brexit right. It's funny to see them argue that the UK is the only sovereign nation in the world and capable of negotiating trade and travel on its own. Every other state seems to have done it. What do you think that the UK, by virtue of leaving the EU, automatically loses uh, some degree of freedom of movement? Like, look at it in my uh, situation. Without a visa or any real status at all, with just a U.S. passport, you can travel to the EU almost flawlessly. Uh, it's very, very quick to enter, and you can mill about and visit all of these countries and go back, and people from the UK, uh, EU can do the same in the U.S. It's a sort of reciprocal agreement. It just makes sense because the idea is that, by and large, people are going to have tolerance for the same general lifestyle, the same laws... They're not likely, like somebody from Norway is not likely to try to illegally immigrate to the U.S. because of the standard of living being higher and so forth. Uh, so there's reci reciprocity and movement. The U.K. doesn't magically lose that just because they're not part of the E.U. They, again, Japan has it. They're not part of the E.U. The U.S. has it. The U.S. isn't part of the E.U. I think Canada's on that list too, Australia and some of these other countries. And it's not like the UK doesn't have a huge sphere left over from when it was the main world power. You've got a huge amount of influence with certain countries there diplomatically. Hammer out a trade deal with them. The US is itching for one. Trump has brought it up. India comes to mind definitely as a possible source of a trade deal as well. Something more lucrative than the trade that you have right now. Why does it have to be Europe? What do they have to offer? Like, you know, like people wanted their German bonbons and their French cheese. Okay, well, the, okay, you, I'm sorry, you have to get cheese from Wisconsin for a year instead of getting it from France. How fucking impoverished can you possibly be? Terrible times ahead. You, you can't get your Italian wine. Oh, my God. Your, your Greek uh, cheese. I mean, it's, seriously. The UK has a large enough economy, a large enough population, enough arable land, enough output, and enough technological and educational capabilities so that it should be able to do something on its own. You should be able to survive on your own. I, I mean, how do you go from ruling the world to a hundred years later saying we can't even have self-determination because we'll get bullied around by other nations? Where's that British spirit of ingenuity? Where's that can-do spirit? Somebody uh, the other day criticized me. They said, well, British people are not like that. More of them are like the North meme or something. Oh, okay, understood. There's like like hooligans and people that just want to have their ale and something. That's the same in any country, dude. The, the UK is not unique in that. It's still, again, it's not like the UK is incapable of competing. I think that things will be just fine. There are a lot of pessimists there who have been black-pilled into thinking that everything will... All hell will break loose if we leave the EU. The EU is the only thing keeping us safe. Uh, Hail Merkel. It's basically just Nazis anyway. It's basically Germany running roughshod over everyone using Brussels as a cudgel. <laughs> World War III won without firing a shot. The German side won this time. It's similar, isn't it? 
It's like World War I, uh, the Germans over in those trenches there are going to kill us all. World War II, those Germans in those planes and tanks are going to kill us all. You kind of almost have like a third level there with, you know, the separation, the partition of Germany and Eastern Germany is like a symbol of communism being like fucked up. Uh, and then you have more dictatorial weird leadership there and then that finally ends and now you've got Angela Merkel. I'm not saying that there's a systemic problem here that rears its head every few decades, but there's a systemic problem there that rears its head every few decades. So like the boomer problem, I guess, in the West. I and mean, come on, the UK is capable of doing things themselves. The big risk, the big risk is the same one that I've been talking about all along. Come the end of January, the UK's economy will be under fire by a bunch of CEOs and bankers who are British, who are English people and Welsh people and Scottish and North Irish. They're going to do everything that they can to bring your economy down because they want to convince you that Brexit's responsible so that you'll petition to rejoin the EU. That's what it'll be about. Or, or at least to adopt fiscal leftism, which of course always uh, actually benefits the rich. Labor's proposals, who they benefit? The, the billionaires. That's who it'll benefit. It's inevitable. That's why I oppose Bernie Sanders here. His snake oil about caring about the little people doesn't pass the sniff test when you look at his actual proposals. Because once administered by a powerful enough government, that government will squander that money. The same as it's done with Social Security and every other fucking program they ever implemented. Fuck them. U.S. government's incapable of administering things centrally. But guess what? The U.K.'s government isn't so much better. Yours isn't capable of it either. And the EU's authorities are even less capable. They're a post-nationalist state. They're even more corrupt. The EU's terrible. It's a terrible idea on paper, and it's a terrible idea in practice. The benefits that you get from it could be hammered out by the individual nations themselves without the EU even existing. It's like, you know, from, again, from here in the Netherlands, I can travel to Brussels today and there, there's no real border there. You could accomplish that without the EU existing. Having a currency union, having a single currency pegged to all of the other currencies at an exchange rate that can be interchanged between countries without having to lose any money when you exchange it could be accomplished without the EU. Yes, it's possible to administer. You could have a singular authority for economic purposes over a currency that didn't involve anything else and didn't have any further power. Hell, you could even have a fusion military, a joint military system, like a NATO-style thing. You don't need the EU to administer it. All of the benefits that people perceive of as having an EU in the first place would be better served apart from the EU. It's the same as the provisions of Obamacare in the U.S., that are positive, and there are some pre-existing conditions. Obamacare takes care of a situation where prior people couldn't get health insurance if they had a condition to begin with. Oh, you got asthma? <laughs> Fuck yourself, you can't get insurance. Now, of course, all they can do is offer them a slightly more expensive plan, which tends to be subsidized. Well, you could have accomplished this with half a page. You didn't need Obamacare, 10,000 pages of legalese. Extending coverage under parental plans to kids up to age 25 through college, you could have done that on its own. All of the provisions that anyone ever found positive or necessary could have been done in a single two or three page long bill. We could have read it, understood what was in it, and passed it. All of the legalese, bureaucratic, nightmarish, anti-transparent bullcrap of Brussels should be swept aside, and the European people, individually as sovereign nations, should reaffirm their friendship and cooperation and say, look, we're not going to fight each other. We're going to trade, we're going to travel, we're going to get along peaceably on this continent, and that's it. And we don't need the EU to do that. We're intelligent enough to do it ourselves. Are the European people really not intelligent and organized enough to do that? You build empires, but all of a sudden you've lost that capability. I don't think so. I think the UK will be just fucking fine. That's about all. Peace out.